Hey, today's interview, we have an opportunity to see other ways that you can have a career in pursuing art. If galleries, if making prints and g-clays of your art and not selling your work in galleries and having to frame your work, this interview is for you. We're going to go ahead and talk to my new good friend, Steve Mitchell, who has an amazing presence here on this platform here at YouTube. So without any further ado, let's go to this interview. Uh, Steve Mitchell from Mind of Watercolor. So without any other further ado, how are you doing, Steve? Hey, Gabriel. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. So I know there's a lot of people that are going to be watching this and some of you have maybe crossed paths with Steve and you've watched his show and uh, he has shared so much about uh, the way paper and paints and, and things work. And, but we're going to get to know a little bit about him today. And so... Right off the get-go, Steve, I'm just curious, um, how has watercolor been rewarding for you? I know you have a background in illustration, and you've been dabbling and, and keep doing these wonderful videos here on this platform of YouTube. Um, how has watercolor been rewarding for you? Oh, that's a... That's an interesting way to put it. Uh, I think it most it was most rewarding that uh, I caught on to it pretty quick. I feel like uh, I mean we're talking the seventies is when I was introduced to it. Um, yeah, I'm I'm that old. Uh, it I was I I was mostly a pencil artist and I had dabbled in some acrylic and a little bit of oils and. Uh, I took a class with an instructor who he, he didn't say a whole lot. He just kind of sat down and just started demonstrating it and it clicked. And so from that point on, I just started experimenting and I loved the immediacy of it, the simplicity of it. I mean, you know, mastering it sometimes is anything but simple, but in terms of what a medium, how you use a medium, it's just a brush some watercolor paint and some water and that's it and that's great and you can sit down immediately and start painting you know not a lot of prep is needed not a lot of cleanup is needed so um but i just love i think the most rewarding part was just seeing the beautiful uh luminosity of it the the way you can make things glow and the uh the transparency of it just a lot of things uh and there's always new discoveries i mean 40 plus years later i'm still discovering stuff you know ways of doing things and techniques and so uh, it's complex in that sense you know kind of counterposed to its simplicity and i love that about it that's always rewarding i'd love to learn so I like that answer because, you know, so many people say, you know, watercolor is the hardest medium and so is baking, right? Like I burn a <laughs> lot of cookies out there, right? Yeah. And so could you give us a little snapshot? What did art look like for you growing up? Was that something that was encouraged? It was. Um, it, it was encouraged. Uh, my family... Uh, was primarily musical. Um, my dad was a band director and a choir director. And we kind of moved a couple times because he got jobs at a, a different colleges. He was a band director at a small uh, college in Louisiana. And then we moved to Alabama. And uh, eventually he took a job as the manager of um, a the band department at a big music store. Um, I'm kind of getting off track here, but anyway, they, they had a lot of expectations for me with music. I played in a high school band. I love to play the guitar. I'm not very good, but uh, they saw me going that way. But when I kept drawing 
and painting and asking for paints, you know, for Christmas or birthday and started doing that. They realized that that's probably a better path for me. So they encouraged it. Um, and, you know, I, I really didn't have any kickback there. I, I, I was actually nudged towards a career in art, which is unusual for parents because, you know, art tends to have a reputation for uh, not being a very good career. <laughs> you know, the starving artist syndrome. So yeah, I, I can't complain at all in that respect. And so later in life, what did that look for you? Did you, uh, how did you move into your career? Yeah, I, um, I did not think I wanted to be a commercial artist. I really uh, didn't know anything about design. Uh, I thought I would go ahead and pursue fine art, but I knew that that was not going to be profitable right off the bat. So I went into retail uh, with some management training programs. I thought maybe that will help sort of a business, learn how to run uh, retail operations, learn those kind of things. I worked for a couple of different chains, uh, quickly found out that was not the way to do it. Didn't really learn anything. Uh, that way and i was became a little more disillusioned about being a fine artist and uh, as time went on um graphic design did become a little more interesting and it turns out there was a new marketing firm in town that had just come in and um they were hiring and so i applied as an illustrator an in-house illustrator marketing firm is actually a pretty rare thing around here uh so it was kind of uh, a great opportunity. I was able to meet some other artists and see what the commercial design and illustration market was really like. Unfortunately, that company closed its doors uh, within a year. Um, so I started freelancing. Uh, that was not advisable because I didn't know enough. So I floundered at that for about four years. Um, trying to, you know freelance design and illustration is not a vocation for someone who doesn't have experience that's a vocation for somebody who has gained the experience maybe in a company and then goes out i learned that the hard way uh, but eventually i did get a couple clients and one of them hired me it was a market another marketing firm this one was uh solid in terms of you know it's it's clientele and whatnot hired me as a graphic designer and uh, art director. So I did that for almost six years. And that kind of gave me the uh, in, the uh, experience that I needed to, to go out on my own. So uh, I left them and went out on my own freelance and had up until YouTube, about 30, almost 35 years, that's what I did. I was in business for myself as a graphic designer. I did everything. Um, we're not in the big metropolitan areas, you know, like L.A. or New York or whatever. So here you don't specialize so much. I wish I had been able to. So I was did a little bit of everything. Logo design, a lot of corporate work, a lot of corporate ad design, uh, some illustration. We're in an industrial area, so there was a lot of... Um, uh, technical illustration. So all during that time, uh, I didn't get to use watercolor a lot, uh, but I did it for myself on the side and just kind of tried to keep brushed up on it. And up until uh, I started my YouTube channel, that was what I did. And I kind of got tired of it. I mean, the industry changed over the years and you know, digital uh, tools became better and better, and, but clients just thought that was magic. So you ought to be able to do things better, faster, and cheaper. And I wasn't enjoying it. So I was looking for ways to do something else, you know, as I sort of glided towards my retirement. And YouTube was uh, not new, but as I started my channel in 2014, but about a year and a half prior to that, I was looking into ways I could make it work and monetize it. 
And, you know, bit by bit, I started doing that, making some videos side by side with some freelance work because I, I had to still make a living. And in 2017, I went full time with YouTube. So that was the path in in a nutshell right there. That's so good. You know, um, I, you gave a little nugget there, you know, and I remember like growing up, just so many people wanted to be a children's book illustrator. Oh. You know? And what what a hard career to get into as a freelance book, you know, oh, children's yeah. book illustrator. So and, much competition. For oh, that. my goodness. And most of the people that I met uh, in Scribby, if you don't know, that's like a children's book illustrators group. Uh, used to be real popular back in the day. You don't hear so much about them now. They're still okay. writing together and whatnot. But uh, what was interesting was that people would say, you've got to be in the industry first before you can freelance. And now it yeah. seems like, you know, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about this here in a little bit. A question that I've seen and, and asked about is, how have you seen the trends with art that have changed and i know we're going to dive into that really good for when we get to your youtube channel okay yeah. and i i'm really grateful that you said that you know about you know that's something that people don't know about that, that you have to actually be in that circle before you get out of the circle to work back in the circle it's really true it's really true yeah no it um yeah, I did some children's book illustration, by the way. Um, it was not a major career path, but uh, there were fellow, fellow illustrators that lived in my same area. They they had a rep. They had a, a New York uh, rep. And they started, when they got overloaded, they would sometimes hire me to help them do uh, some colorizations and a few other things. And eventually that that rep started hiring me uh to do some work most of it was licensing work like for uh scholastic or some other ones like there was some disney some fisher price uh some matchbox books so it wasn't like original children's book stuff but no you were absolutely right uh you know had i not known them just to do it cold try to get into the industry uh no way you know, it's they they had a path that was just sort of focused on that. And if I hadn't have been good colleagues with them, I wouldn't have had a chance to do any of that. And that's how these interviews started was people uh, and here in San Diego are taking my intro to watercolor class and I'm watching 14 take off and some, you know, stick around for intermediate and they just don't know the different camps of watercolor and yeah. all the other different camps of gouache and mixed media that are working with watercolor. Yeah. And so fast forward now to the YouTube channel. And one of the things that I love about your YouTube channel is you bring in these products and you're showing, uh, you know, what sketchbooks you like or which colors I love the moments that you try this uh, brand of color with this brand, and you tell us why you've picked the certain colors. Okay. So, well, that's interesting to know. Yeah. So how 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 have you enjoyed that experience of being an influencer with your channel? Uh, oh, I mean, immensely, and uh, you know the it's it's very very genuine for me because this was self-education uh as i through the years as i did watercolor really any kind of illustration with or fine art for that matter with natural media i had a very limited uh selection of supplies and it's funny because i i tell viewers all the time that i used student grade watercolors for most of my illustration career, if I ever did watercolor for a professional piece, I didn't know the difference. I just knew they were cheaper. So um, after I started 
well, just before I started my YouTube channel, I had the occasion to try a artist grade, you know, professional level watercolor. And it's like, whoa, okay, there is some difference here, uh, you know, and the price might be justified. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of carry that through everything. I, you know, I, I get curious uh, about how things will combine. And then I want to try to find the best, uh, whether it's color pencil or brush or, you know, and so the question always in my mind is, is that better? Will that make a difference? A lot, sometimes it doesn't, you know, you sometimes you spend money for no reason. Other times it's like, oh, okay, I see. So it, it was all very much self-educating. And um, I'm probably doing a little bit less and less of it as I've learned more about what I love and, uh, you know, what's come up that I haven't tried is becoming less frequent. So I still try to keep on top of new things. Uh, one of the big trends, I don't know if it's a trend, but it was certainly there was a demand for uh, cotton, 100% cotton watercolor sketchbooks. You know, cotton paper has always been out there, but the sketchbooks are usually a lower grade paper. So uh, in my channel and talking through other YouTube artists and stuff, I feel like we sort of have helped drive that request, I guess, demand for it. Um, the uh, a guy named Erwin Leon made what's called the Perfect Sketchbooks, one of my favorites. And then he ended up selling that to Etcher, Etcher Labs. So a lot of things uh, we've seen major uh, paper companies like uh, Anamula make cotton sketchbooks and, and it's just been great. So in that sense, that's what I've loved. That's been very rewarding to kind of introduce people to these things and also kind of drive, you know, the market. I, I, I am proud to say I have, sold out many products on amazon <laughs> just <laughs> just from a recommendation that, that, that actually kind of su surprised me it's like you know after a week on a video people are saying well, i can't get it anymore they're all gone but you know i'm i'm just that's a little bit of bluster <laughs> but anyway those things are fun you know that's so, so. good and i love you know what I really have enjoyed is each year you've done like, hey, if you're thinking about buying stuff for, for an artist, like check out these, you know, pens or these brushes. If you were buying something for me, like this is what I'd like and this is why. And, you know, I've seen some YouTubers and some artists try to get on this this platform and just uh, they fumble through the video. And, and I know you got to start somewhere. But the yeah. fact that you did some of the exploring and discovery for us, um, and then you kind of, you tell us why the importance of that 100% cotton. You kind of educate us, like, why, if you had this much money, go here, you know. And if you have this much money, yeah, start here. And that's been very helpful. Uh, what well, is... And what has the feedback been um, for when you do those kind of things? Yeah, uh, it's it's very encouraging. And it's great to hear you say that because uh, that tells me I'm on the right path. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I kind of, when I put together, I guess what you would call a plan, business plan for this channel, was what was my brand you know, going to be like, what What was the mind of watercolor going to be? How would I distinguish myself from all the others that are out there just doing an occasional tutorial or whatnot? And the niche then, it's not so much a niche anymore, uh, but the niche then when I started was that there wasn't a lot of quick tips and techniques, just kind of like, uh, I called it sort of water cooler discussions. So if you can imagine yourself working in a company and you take a break, you know, and go to the water cooler and, oh, hey, there's another person and you just, you just kind of chew the fat for a little bit. So I imagine people stopping by my studio, maybe a neighbor, uh, you know, and then 
we strike up a conversation. So oh, I see you have that on your drawing board. What's that? You know, it's, oh, yeah, this is pretty cool. I was just trying this. Maybe you, you'd be interested. So I wanted that sort of a vibe, you know, uh, just a, a neighbor and a friend dropping by and we just get into a discussion. Um, and it, it, the feedback on that has been really great. It's it, it's kind of kept me on that path. Oh, I love those Christmas episodes. Those are so much fun to do because, you know, inevitably a lot of watercolor artists or really any artists, they'll just, they'll put the do gift suggestion uh, videos. We'll, we'll just kind of say the, the standard stuff that most artists will buy. Well, I tried to approach it differently. It's like, what would you give an artist something that he might buy if he saw it, but maybe didn't know it existed or puts it at the bottom of the list because they have more important things they need to get first. You know what I'm saying? Just, or, or in a nice form that it's like, okay, I can't afford the, the 36 pencil set. So I'm going to buy the 12 pencil set, or maybe I, there's this color set and I would get this, but this is more important. Well, you show them the this, you know, the thing that would be extra. So that that's always been the fun part for me. And also bringing in uh, individual private artisans, too, which I try to at least feature one every time I do that. I didn't do a, a Christmas gift episode this last year, but hopefully I will this year. Well, so, thanks to the algorithm, they put out your past one. So that was pretty good. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, what I also enjoy uh, that, you know, in, in, yes, like I too, like in college, I used uh, the Van Gogh watercolors, you know, and I, I, I've stepped up my game to like Daniel Smith now. And yeah. so, but at that, that, that time, I didn't know any better. You know, I didn't pay attention to granulation. I didn't know about stuff. You know, I knew this color was somewhat staining. Same, but I didn't same know. here. And so I that's what I really enjoy. Like each little segment that you've had, you've talked about, you know, you did one recently about the Daniel Smith wash that came out and and where you got it from. That's been really helpful too. So I really appreciate that. So sure. people are probably, you know, do you have a favorite watercolor that you like to use? Uh, my favorite uh, is M. Graham, uh, and I I quickly caution people not to take the word favorite as superior. Uh, I I was watching another watercolor artist this morning. I think it was Liron Liron Yukonsky. Uh, he had a great answer about that. He says, "Look, it's there's so many good brands. Uh, Daniel Swift's another one. Da Vinci's another one. You know." Several European brands are fantastic. The best one uh, I would go for, you know, if you're a serious watercolor, so I would go for an artist grade. And then the best one is the one that you can get the easiest and the least expensive. And that's how I actually found M. Graham is our, we, we don't have a lot of big art supply uh, stores here because we're not a, a, a big city. So uh, there was like one and one art store that's been there forever. And all they had was either Windsor and Newton. I have tried them before. I don't care for them or M. Graham. I thought, OK, we'll give it a try. And absolutely, absolutely loved it. And they're just right there. You know, I could in 10 minutes, I can run down there and pick up a tube and come back with it. So it was sort of a forced favorite, but every since then, every other watercolor I've tried compared to it has not been any better. So I thought I don't need to switch, but I have tried other ones just because I know my viewers are interested. Now I've got all kinds of brands, but that that's consistently been my favorite, I would say. So. Yeah, before I went full on Daniel Smith, I was using McGram. Uh, I, I lucked out in my humble beginnings. Uh, I had a lady from the San Diego Watercolor Society 
she had just bought a whole uh, list of colors for a workshop for Thomas Schaller. And so oh. they were all Daniel Smith colors. So yeah. she handed me this bag at the Watercolor Society and I opened it up and it was about like, you know, 60 some tubes, uh, wow. some half used, some brand new, never used. And I was like, well, I guess we're painting with Mick and McGram. And uh, <laughs> it was interesting because some of those colors I couldn't get anywhere. And I was like, and that was kind of a bummer for me, like with Windsor Newton, some colors went away, like recently, I think it was like the Cerulean or something. And so, you know, when some of these car companies aren't making us colors anymore uh, for cars, like we lose out as artists, you know? Yeah. 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 And um, so how do you like, you know, Mick Graham, just so some of you folks know out there, it's like a honey base. And uh, could you just if, you know, I know you're very knowledgeable. Can you explain the difference between the two binders? OK, well, it is gum beer. It is gum Arabic based. Okay. Honey is an addition. So what honey does is it's it's called a humicant. So it, it, it aids the. Um, moisturization, hum humidification of the watercolor. So it's a standard watercolor and the, 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 the main binder is still gum Arabic, but they add the honey. They use a blackberry honey, I think. And um, it, it keeps it moist. Now, the biggest uh, criticism of M. Graham is that it, it's goopy and it doesn't dry to a hard cake. Um, it will dry, you know, but it always stays tacky, like like chewing gum. Um, some people have had trouble using it in plein air palettes that might sit like this in a backpack. I actually have never had a problem with it. You just have to leave them out to dry for a long time, like maybe over a week or two. But they don't get quite as hard as some others. The benefit to all of it is that they re-wet almost instantaneously there's like no re-wetting factor almost at all you take a damp brush and put it on uh, a dry a uh, well of of m gram and you get uh, almost an inky concentrated mixture right away almost right away so that's what i've always loved about them and the honey addition also uh, helps them get more concentration of pigment in the color. So it's one of the most pigmented watercolors out there. And, uh, you know, it's not a big difference. I mean, uh, a lot of other watercolors are great, but you will notice uh, how, how high the concentration of pigmentation is if you use it and compare it for very long. It's, it's uh, really quite impressive. So that's what I love. And that's great uh, for tinting strength. So you get a lot more color in a very, very thin, thin, thin wash. So I, I agree with you. And yes, being a plein air painter, I learned really quick. If you fill up those wells, do not get on the plane right away or don't throw it in your backpack right away. And you are correct. If you let it set out. Um, like I have like the, the metal pallets, uh, they breathe a little more. Some of those pallets that seal up, they'll keep them gooey a little bit longer. Um, and then I've also noticed though, like some plastic pallets will actually, uh, since plastic's still curing, um, it kind of gets that uh, paint is set up a little faster. And oh. so just knowing the surface, um, I really liked uh, how the McGram kind of acted in my um, Cheap Joe's uh, ceramic uh, a little mixing oh. tray that I have okay. by them. And, uh, but yeah, and I know we had, we were kind of running around in the same circles with like the brush guys and yeah. whatnot, and they have a plethora of brushes. How did you get introduced to the brush guys? Uh, they contacted me. I, I don't uh, think I even knew about them. I just got an email one day, uh, you know, uh, and they introduced themselves. And uh, 
you know, I said, would you like to put a selection, you know, and be a sort of an affiliate? And I said, sure. I, I had not worked with any other company that was just focused mainly on brushes. So uh, it was great. And so I went through and just kind of picked out favorites that I was already using. And uh, it's nice because uh, the only other affiliate that I'm using is Amazon. And a lot of times you can't find stuff. You can sometimes find the most common, but you know, if it's something special, you, you're, you're, you're probably not going to find it on Amazon. So it was great in terms of brushes to be able to work, working with them on that. But other than that, it's, uh, you know, I, I keep their link in all my descriptions and, uh, people seem to go there and find brushes that they like. So that's nice. Nice to be able to put a list like that up, uh, with them. For sure. Yeah, and uh, for me, I, I paint with a lot of Escoda brushes and Escoda being outside of the U.S., uh, the contract with um, Speedball. And so I got in contact with Speedball and then they started putting more brushes on Amazon. And um, what kind of what kind of I mean, we did, it was, it's, it's, it happens. Like I did that with Chief Joe's with uh, Watercolor Live. They, this plein air easel here. Uh, they're still on back order on making this Ericsson plein air easel. Oh, and yeah. so that's why I was laughing when you said, you know, you got the message, hey, um, they're on back order. And so <laughs> how, how has that been for you? You know, we're trying to find more than one way to supplement our income. And how has Amazon helped your, uh, you know, business? Yeah, it's been steady. Uh, it's been a, a steady little um, supplement. So, uh, you know, it, it's great. I mean, a, a lot of people are prime subscribers, so you get stuff quick. Um, I mean, it's frustrating when you can't find everything but uh it was definitely a help you know it definitely doesn't make a, a lot of income for me but i try to always it, it kills two birds with one stone uh, i mean from the time i started my channel i was not prepared for how much people were going to ask me every little thing that i was using i mean every little thing and if i meant left out anything someone would catch it it's like oh you know it's like i didn't think they'd be interested in that so early on <laughs> i got used to just making sure i had a complete as complete a list as i could below and everything in that list that i could get from the from amazon i would so that just benefited me helped them didn't cost them any money so uh it's been great you know that's all i can say it's been great that's so good. And there was one episode I was cracking up because uh, you were like, you were talking about uh, a, a new easel that sits on your drafting table. And then uh, you are you said something to the effect that like, oh, you should have probably asked me which drafting table this is or something <laughs> like that. But it was hilarious because because. Uh, I got it right away. Like people are probably messaging you like, well, yes, you're telling me I should check out this tabletop easel, which I really loved because that easel dropped lower below your table. Yeah. So yeah, I remember that one now. Yeah, yeah. I actually saw that at a Jerry's Artorama in Phoenix. Uh, I have an uh, uncle who lives in Phoenix. I was out there visiting. So I came back and ordered one. I think I think I did order it through Amazon or someplace. Now I don't remember where I got it, but that was similar or almost identical. Yeah, I know the episodes you're talking about. So, but I I it just it still continues to surprise me, and I I will forget something every now and then. I mean, we're talking about I may have a sketchbook that I hold open with one of these clips. And it's like, I forget to put that clip in there. I was like, where'd you get the clips? 
And it's like, okay, uh, I'll list the clips, you know. Uh, I, I've been getting back to doing a few shorts lately on YouTube. And I did a short not too long ago that uh, it wasn't at all about brushes. And it's like I was, I was showing uh, how brushes are intended and designed in watercolor to manage water, not paint. You know, you paint with oils and acrylics. You're painting paint. You're moving paint around with watercolor. You're just painting with water that has color in it. So that was basically the theme of the short. And of course, somebody says, what's that brush? <laughs> you know, I, I can't help but want to be smart aleck about it and say, it's just a watercolor brush. It's it's okay. one of like a dozen that would work just fine. But, you know, people want to know. So uh, we're probably all want to know, you know, uh, what makes it good. I, my personal opinion and some of the past interviews is spending some time drawing and sketching. Do you have a favorite sketchbook that you like to use? Um, I have a, I have what I call a, um, sort of a go-to trash sketchbook where I do literally anything. And it's just plain paper. It's nothing special. It was a Canson, I believe. And um, that uh, that's where, I mean, I'll use anything from marker, color pencil to, to just regular drawing pencil and pen and ink in there. Uh, beyond that, I try to use um, maybe some mixed media types. I don't necessarily have a favorite. Uh, maybe Stillman Burn is a favorite. In terms of mixed media, um, because I'm starting to sketch more with watercolor as if it were a pencil. And so I like to make sure I have something that will handle that. Uh, the Stillman and Burn, I think it's the Zeta and the Beta. I'm not sure. Those are pretty good. Um, but, you know, when it comes to just plain paper uh, with pencil and any other kind of media, I don't really have a favorite. Most most anything works great for that. Those are just those are just junk books for me. I just put anything in them. Don't intend for anybody to see it. Experiments, thumbnails, you know, something maybe more finished. But yeah, uh, I have favorite watercolor sketchbooks, you know. But probably the the uh the perfect sketchbook is probably my favorite because it's actual uh fabriano artistico paper and um i'm really liking the new hanamula 100 cotton sketchbooks those are those are good so yeah yeah i just saw the hanamula guys uh just recently at the plain air convention and they have a black paper now that's watercolor oh. That really? a lot of the gouache people are hopping on. Yeah, yeah, sure. There's a smooth one or a textured one. Okay. Well, I and, haven't uh, seen those. I have a Stonehenge one. Stonehenge puts out a cotton black. Oh, yeah. Stonehenge, too. Yes. I saw those guys also. And uh, they had their black paper, too. I was like, yeah. I'm waiting for that one to come in the mail so I can try it. I've never uh, done anything on black paper uh, much, so I need to try to plan something out for that. But. You know, the fun paper that I didn't even think about. Uh, someone just gave me this paper. It was a, it was a, it was it was a Indian paper that's really rough, and I've just oh, yeah. experimented. I take the Daniel Smith watercolor sticks, and I've just grab don't even look and i just grab two like this and then i go okay let's see how these two play and it's just an exploration i would get up before the teenager woke up and the wife and yeah. I would be with my coffee just <laughs> kind of like in a meditation just playing around on this crazy paper and i I'm, now i kind of like i'm kind of like why did i do it on that paper because Everybody wants me to pronounce it, and it's the hardest paper to pronounce. Yeah, it's not. Uh, yeah, there the the one Indian paper I can think of is Kadi. No, not Kadi. Indigo. 
So indigo is similar to what it's a handmade Indian paper. This one's with an S. S. It's, it almost sounds like it almost sounds like a, a German word. Uh, when oh, I oh is it? To... Yeah, I know which one you're talking about. I don't Shenzhen know how to pronounce or, or something. Yeah, it looks like Shizen. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it either. I was so embarrassed one time, one time I accidentally said like a German curse word. And I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that just came out all wrong. I apologize. <laughs> and, uh, that was at a demo because I was just showing that like, you know, and that's what I love about your show is with, as as your show gives us hope as fine artists where you really can't have that writer's block. Because, you know, you could try a new brush, you could try a paper, you could try a different company of paint. And, and, and you've been so kind to like even show us like, hey, I'm going to paint a forest and these are the colors I'm using and why, you know, and thank you so much for that. That's been oh, so sure. helpful. You know, I... Uh... It's it, again, it's really encouraging to hear you say that because it's just it's the way my mind works. It's the way I would like to to have people tell me things, you know, it's like, uh, give me some some ideas, some reasons. You know, when I was a budding illustrator, just trying to learn stuff, uh, I met a group of guys that were really good illustrators. We kind of had a little group going and um goodness i was just like taking it in they they would drop little nuggets of from their experience almost every time we got together and i thought i want to i want to be able to do that you know someday to because the things that that we do you know that we do every day and we do commonly um a lot of people out there don't know you know and it may just seem commonplace to us so it's uh it, it's encouraging to hear that and I, I that's just being me just just doing it the way i'd like to hear it if i heard it for the first time i guess so, so uh also one thing i wanted to hit on was your co-host how did you end up <laughs> with your co-host yeah so he's just he's a story uh he's a story talking about him yes there he is yeah. So this is Reese. Yep. Uh, he's uh, he's been with me as long as I've had my career. Uh, bought him about 1988, I'm guessing. I bought him at Michael's Craft Store. They had it on a. It's just an anat one of those scientific anatomy models. Um, they had him on an end cap for sale, so they were uh, clearing it out. And I thought, oh, why not? You know, every artist needs a skull. Uh, and, you know, I was trying to get better at portraiture and drawing and painting the head. So uh, I bought it. Um, he He's this really crappy looking yellow. <laughs> so if, you, if I take the skull out, you can see it's a really ugly yellow. So I thought I got to do something about that. So I like completely covered him in acrylic paint, brown acrylic paint. And then wiped it off, <laughs> just to just to kind of uh, give him a little more patina. It looked like he had been dug up, but that was so. That uh, he's been with me all that time. He didn't have a name, but he's just always been uh, my studio uh, skull model for drawing. Then when uh, I started, about the, about the time I started YouTube, uh, my daughter, who went with a group. To Hershey, Pennsylvania, brought me back a hat. My favorite candy is Reese's peanut butter cups. And she brought back the hat, you know, that he wears. So um, I have hats sitting around and uh, I decided to use him as a hat stand and I put it on him. So he, he sat around my studio with that, that hat on. I thought I'll just name him Reese. And it's kind of like, Frosty the Snowman, you know, when they put on the top hat, it kind of brought him to life. <laughs> I started putting him in videos for one main reason. And, uh, 
the humor if i there is any humor <laughs> is corny it's pretty cornball but i do that to keep myself from taking myself too seriously because there are artists out there that they take themselves way too seriously you know and it, i just it's a reminder to me that this uh whole youtube journey started out and i want it to continue to be fun fun for me for the fun for my viewers and not to take my myself too seriously not to get too stuffy with the art content and just have fun that's that's the whole story so if i don't have him in a video for very long i have viewers saying where's reese where's reese <laughs> so there you go i've noticed when reese is a bit at the show for sure <laughs> and uh but I'll I'll be totally honest like it wasn't I mean I've I've wanted this moment to interview but until you went around shaking a tree's hand <laughs> just recently and people are gonna watch this maybe 10 years 20 years from now like that's not a recent <laughs> video but it was it was that was the final draw I was like this guy is hilarious I've got to interview him he is out plein air painting and shaking <laughs> hands with trees. And um, thank you so much. Like, uh, sure. from my heart, on the hard days of being an artist, because being an artist is not easy, uh, no. watching your videos where you've let loose and, and, and threw out a little bit of sass in there, um, <laughs> it's been very, I don't have to go see a therapist. I mean, if I if you need to go see a therapist, go ahead. But just a little <laughs> bit of that humor has helped. Thank you so That's much. Fun. That's funny. That's great. I, I really appreciate you saying that. That's great. You know, some of that humor is so, so cornball, you know, so eye rollingly corny, but it it keeps me humble because uh, I know people are there are people out there because they've, they've told me that that have the eye rolls, you know, when I do some of that stuff. That's fine. Uh, this is all, you know, this is all for fun. And uh, I just can't, can't get too serious about it or uh, it loses that fun if I do that. So, so true. And just to bring it right back in, um, you know, uh, what has been, you've, you've been an artist for quite some time. What does the trends look like for uh, art? You know, I've seen better products come out since I've been around in this world. Uh, could you go a little bit uh, about that? Um, yeah. Now, by trends, do you mean in terms of materials or style, uh, media? However you want to go. Like, however you want to share. Yeah. Um, gouache is hot right now. Uh, that's a trend I'm seeing um, uh, of the watercolor type stuff I do. Line and wash is really hard. So we'll talk about these styles first. Mixed media, I feel like, has grown since I started my channel, the ideas of it, and which is great because I love mixed media. I love uh, putting anything with watercolor uh, to give sort of a different look. So that's that's. Uh, really hot and I think some of that's come over from illustration channels too so that's neat in terms of uh, materials I'm not really really seeing any specific trends but uh, I, you know just um, new painters have just totally flooding uh, places like uh, YouTube uh, to see a whole new influx of new painters just wanting interested tr wanting to try wanting to know how to get started um I think uh for a while and I saw an even bigger surge probably during COVID I guess people at home needing to find something to do um just wanting to learn so that's kind of the the industry if you will that I'm trying to tap into. I have no interest personally. I don't have any problem with artists that do, but personally I have no interest in galleries and prints and frame frameable art. I mean, I, I've done that. 
uh, might do some of that. I uh, just have a lot of fun sharing knowledge and about 75% of my art now is in sketchbooks. Um, you know, I see James Gurney do that. So I like to do that. I, I've had my fill, I think, over the years of trying to do finished piece for clientele. And uh, I just am enjoying exploring medium and seeing what I can learn, seeing what I can uh, discover. And uh, I love having all of that in sketchbooks and, you know, sort of holding it for myself. Probably what I'll do in terms of a product, at least this is what I'm planning. I don't have anything on the drawing board right now, but is to take lots of images from these sketchbooks and put it into a publication and uh, maybe make that available. So that would be like my my art to the world, if you will. Yes, please. I would buy that so. book <laughs> or flashcards. Yeah. <laughs> I would yeah. I would buy something you know of uh, your favorite you know images. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Like uh, I too have noticed the gouache surge. You know I used gouache in college. My my teacher was uh, for the color theory class. It's uh, in college they make you take these intro to art classes, and one of them is color theory, and you have to mix. Uh, colors and in that class we used pantones that were uh, these really expensive flashcards with colors and um, yeah. you had to mix wash and so I remember being frustrated yeah. because wash would go darker after it dried I'd be so yes. frustrated but now I've been noticing the new wash doesn't do that like ugly chalky dark thing right right yeah, um, the the typical gouache over the years, oh, the, really the only good gouache, not the only, but the the main good gouache I knew of years ago was Windsor Newton. They sort of had a corner on the market. I think Royal Talents had a fairly decent one, but uh, it was primarily a designer's uh, color tool. Uh, and it's just like you describe it. Um, and now there are so many companies good fine art companies like Daniel Smith that have gotten into it. Uh, and since I did that review, I'm finding there, that's really a really good gouache. Uh, it doesn't crack for one thing, which is amazing. Uh, you put Windsor Newton out on a pallet and a week later after it's dry, it cracks and falls off. Uh, the Daniel Smith gouache is not doing that. So it really works well in a pallet. That's excellent. And that, you know, M Graham does, pretty well there and their gouache is, is good and i think it might be because they use honey in that too but yeah uh it, the the industry is listening you know and catering to people who are using gouache there's some really fine products out there so, so people are inquiring minds i'm sure are wondering do you have a favorite subject to paint um yeah well landscape uh, trees in particular i like i focus on a lot of uh unique trees i think there's a lot to explore there so many landscape artists treat trees generically i treat trees more like people's faces you know unique uh, structures uh unique trees um there's just so many interesting ways that you can draw them I love portraiture. You don't see a lot of that on my channel. Uh, it's because people don't seem to be real interested in it, um, which is fine because, you know, it's better to focus. And I, I still put landscape first. But I would say second to landscape would be portraiture, figurative. Yeah. So good. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, when I was down there in South Carolina, uh, there was this Kutsu stuff that was taking over everything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, one of my other mentors uh, that lived in Nashville, um, you know, he would, uh, you know, reuse the Kutsu to make baskets and uh, Matt Tommy. Hmm. And uh, it was quite funny because when uh, I was doing a demo there in Asheville, <laughs> I was like, how can I not 
paint uh, this building with leaving the kutsu that's oh, taken yeah. over the uh, telephone wire. <laughs> And, yeah, uh, what I'm is... talking about, folks, or maybe you can explain it, but there's this plant because I'm sure people all around the world are like, what's kutsu? I got to yeah. stop the video to Google it, but it's this it's, plant uh... that takes over everything, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not everywhere, but where where it is, yeah, it takes over. It's actually not, it's a non-native invasive species. It came from, from the Orient. I don't know if it's China or Japan or what one of those, but it, they brought it over in the 50s uh, to prevent erosion and didn't realize, you know, how much it could just take over. I mean, it can grow feet, you know, like feet long in a week. So, uh, you know, you will see it in places. Thankfully, it's not everywhere, but uh when you see it, you know it. That's, you know, I guess it is unique to the South. <laughs> you know, um, I was interesting is, you know, I, you talked about, you know, what people enjoy watching and, and you um, have been choosing landscape and trees over portraiture. Um, how, I mean, for, for a new YouTuber or an artist that's on the social media, because most of the people that are going to be watching this care about social media. And how do you separate yourself if there's one video that's not getting as many views as another video? Uh, what does that look like for you? Yeah, I mean, I will spend some time analyzing it to a degree. I mean, I can't you know, I don't worry about every one because uh, just some people are not going to be interested. Uh, there is so much uh, to, you know, that algorithm that you mentioned. And a lot of it's changed since when I first started YouTube. Uh, you know, they, they used to talk about, and I started 2014 and uh, conventional wisdom was, especially for uh, tutorial channels, how two channels was uh, searchable titles. Now they're saying, oh, not such a great idea because most of your traffic's not going to come from search. So, you know, you there's all kinds of strategies out there now for making hooks. And, uh, and then the other challenge is keeping people's attention. Um, you know, and all of these things, you don't want to necessarily have to pay attention to but if you're going to use youtube you do you know if you if you want anybody watching <laughs> if you want your channel to grow so it's but at the same time i'm trying not to like tap into any huge clickbait uh trends or you know i gotta stay honest but it's a balance i i don't know every every video i I think about how I should do that. Um, look for what are the new trends and what are people responding to? What might they respond to? I, I, I use a certain amount of mystery. I try to use a certain amount of mystery in things like titles because uh, not dishonest, but just because there a lot of people will make up their mind about a video based on a title and they may be way off they may be completely wrong so i think yeah, if i could get people just to take a peek uh, maybe they'll stick around um so that's changed uh you know i, I did very strict literal searchable titles to start and I, i've kind of gotten a, away from that a little bit sometimes i'll come back change the title later but I am no guru strategist on how to do YouTube. I just I just throw it out there and see what happens. And I am still am always surprised, always surprised uh, at which ones really take off and which ones don't. I, I continue to be surprised. And so, you know, why? I sit there and I think, why? I don't know. A lot of times I don't know. So good. And... 
Uh, this is probably the hardest question I've asked people in these interviews is, what is that one thing that you would probably say to an artist that maybe something tragic has happened in their life and they're not creating art? What would you say to them if they were listening? Uh, let's see. Um, something tragic that they're not creating art um well let's let's assume for a minute that they would like to you know they've not just given it up um and but they just don't know how to motivate themselves uh just just start uh the thing that i that works for me is just start um get prepare you know uh, for me uh, cleaning up my work area getting the supply supplies so they're at hand and easy to get to if i had an idea of, my, of what i might do but don't have the energy to do it um you know get get prepared get get whatever it is out uh keep it simple uh i like to do a lot of studies and breakdowns of things which are easy so maybe move away from necessarily doing a full-blown piece painting instead practice something that that you feel like you've needed to practice cordon off a sketchbook into you know four thumbnail quadrants and you know say oh, i wanted to practice reflections in water so do four little ones business card size maybe um and a lot of times uh getting started just generates more interest i mean there's a lot of physical reasons that people don't feel motivated and that's harder you know uh if you're going through there's a lot of uh depression through uh physical you know depression that's caused by physical circumstances, that's tough. So, you know, don't be hard on yourself. That's the advice I give. Just uh, try to do something. Uh, if, if you don't have any more energy than just to pick up a art book and look at some great examples of art, uh, just do that. Just keep, keep your mind in it. Uh, usually a day, uh, people who are struggling with physical issues, usually a day will come around where you you feel like doing something. Um, but don't put a lot of pressure on yourself. Don't feel like, oh, you know, I really feel like painting today. What am I going to do? I don't want to waste my time. Just do anything. Draw anything. Paint anything. Yeah. That's, That's really so good. advice. Yeah. That's so good. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, just as a lighthearted question is, do you ever do any bad paintings, Steve? Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I've done tons of them. Uh, I have a video on one of them <laughs> <laughs> where I messed up a sky and I kept trying to fix it. So, yeah, um, and you will, you know. You, you just will you, you have to just uh everybody does it and you know this is the this is sort of the lie of youtube and instagram reels and uh shorts is that uh artists out there they try to make their lives look perfect like their art is perfect and they wave a magic wand and all of their art just comes out great uh, i'm here to tell you you're not into YouTube and haven't made YouTube videos. Uh, that's just not real. That's the, they've they've edited it down to make it look that way. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for being transparent because I know there's a lot of people that fight with that inner critic, and you know, uh, you know, one little mistake they just you know it crushes them because their their critic is so left brain hard smashing them when they make one little mistake 
I personally, I can know that a really good painting is going to come out because this one over here, uh, painting plein air, was a real turd. And then I go around the corner and then I paint one that just, uh, I don't know what happened, but yeah. that one gets, you know, a third place or a second yeah. place award in the next, you know, jury exhibit. And so I would highly suggest just like you being transparent, just keep on and keep on. Yeah. Yeah. It's problem solving. Um, I'll, most of art is problem solving. And uh, I don't think enough artists take that approach. You know, it's, they just, it, there's a cycle of do it and then do it again and try to do it better and then do it again, try to do it better without trying to solve the specific problems that, are causing, you know, the failures. So you got to break it down. You got to solve the individual problems and you got to identify them and work on them. That's the only way. And I'm just curious, is there a favorite video uh, that you have that you've done uh, over the, uh, you know, your YouTube adventure? Hmm. Is there one that comes to mind? There isn't one. I've had several where, um, uh, and I can't think of specific, I certainly can't think of the names of them, where uh, something came out of the process that I didn't expect that delighted me. So I can probably identify maybe a half a dozen of those. Uh, uh, there's a couple of them. Uh, there's one in particular I did of a tree um, it's not necessarily that the tree was that great, but I, I wanted to approach it one way and I changed mid mid stream on the, the technique I was using and treated it another way. And it just, it was not at all what I expected and I loved it. So, uh, and I rem remember for days after that, just thinking how much I enjoyed that painting. And you look at it and you, you say, okay, well, that's, that's maybe a fairly decent tree. But there was just so much joy tied up with the process of discovery there. Uh, and I've had a few like that. Um, yeah, there was uh, one where I chose a color scheme. And this is more recent. It's probably in the, this year. And uh, it was an odd color scheme. But I just picked three paints I'd never used before. And I thought, yeah. okay, this will make a fun video. And I did a spontaneous painting, which is something I like to do. Um, and, oh, you know, all when I was done, this sort of old broken down wall looked like a wall from antiquity came. And it just, as I was working on it, just sort of materialized. And so I kept bringing it out. And that was another one for days after I thought that was really cool. Now, those experiences are hard to replicate but they make it all worthwhile, <laughs> you know? So there's a few others like that. Um, I don't have any one, you know, the ones that I really plan and work on meticulously and try to get everything just right. Now those, uh, those may turn out okay, but they're usually not uh, the height of joy for me because I like uh, just discovering something new or how something worked in a way that I didn't expect it to work and just kind of making a note of that. That's so good. And, you know, I remember you did like, there was uh, also like this abstract tree thing and that, that too came together like super good. And uh, I will also have to admit uh, there was a cool portrait one that you did. I want to say it was like a military uh like uh old uh i'm trying to think of that period period um you know the black powder guns uh you yeah the war guys Th those were yeah. fun well we we live in an area that was big during the revolution uh, american revolution so uh, yeah you're talking about 18th century late 1700s just prior to the birth of our nation. So there are a lot of reenactments that happen around here. Um, and I took, I have taken a ton of pictures over the years because I would go to these and 
people just have fun you know they dress up and they try to recreate everything the from the crafts the cooking the the costumes all of it so it's tailor made for taking pictures and so some of those are really fun to paint so yeah i've actually done a couple of those on this channel maybe more than a couple yeah i don't know and i also i mean of course i also enjoyed the interview you did with james gurney that was oh, yeah. fun you took us yes. down memory lane how was that how was that what what were you thinking before the interview and what are you thinking now after yeah well there is uh, another youtube artist uh, that sometimes collaborates with me uh, by the name of Marty Owings. Um, and he's not a full-time YouTuber. He has a, another job. He's like a software engineer, but he makes occasional videos. A lot of his stuff is uh, uh, art supply reviews. And uh, he and I have become friends. He lives up in Minnesota. Um, and he would help. he's helped me in the past on some interviews because he used to way back in the day, he was uh, on a local radio station as a talk guy. So he's, it was, I think he's better interviewing than I am. So the two of us kind of uh, collaborate on some of those. It was his idea. Uh, give him all the credit. He's like, Hey, uh, what if we could get James Gurney? And I was like, sure. If you think you can. And he did all the all the legwork and and set it up and it's like the James was really great about it. I mean, he's totally willing, and uh, he you know we feel he fielded all the questions that we had and it was like wow. I mean, that's that's my starstruck right there. You know, <laughs> he's he's a he is an art uh, superhuman as far as I'm concerned. But uh, that that was <laughs> that was how that happened. I can't take any credit for it. Just I just showed up. And that was funny too, because on on my end, I'm thinking, wait, does Marty speak dinosaur? Like, is this going to be an interpreter? Oh, you guys are tag teaming. Okay, this is cool. You guys are like, hey, this is like the car talk guys. I don't know if you remember them. They, People will call clack. in and they say, my car is doing this kaboom, chicka ching cheap. And they're like, oh, that's your fan bell. You know, it's the timing bell. It's about to go. You know, You're talking like, about I, uh, Click and Clack, the Tappet Brothers. Yeah, those dudes. They were on like uh, AM radio or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And so that's how that kind of came across from my uh, <laughs> view was because uh, I, I, I was like, wait, there's two dudes and not just you and yeah. so yeah i i've really enjoyed uh you did uh one with a young lady recently she's a youtuber too and i ran into her her name oh i feel horrible nice emily olson gal. emily olson there you go emily yes i ran into emily and uh super nice super nice yeah. she was out there playing yeah. air painting with us killing it and, oh, um, cool! Yeah, I really enjoyed that interview you did with her. Yeah, very talented young lady. Very she's, nice. She's young to me. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And uh, just to sum up this uh, interview, and because this is such a good pleasure. And uh, so, what is what is something that we can look forward to in the future uh, with your channel? Hmm. Well, um, I don't have anything special planned. I do uh, expect to do, uh, like you, I am planning to get more uh, into some interviews. Uh, actually, doing an interview with Emily was sort of a kickoff to that. I used to do more of them, and, and Marty was part of that. Um, I will, I'm planning to do some. Some of those we did live. Uh, but I'm probably going to do it like you is is record them and edit them. Um, and, you know, I hate to mention any names because I don't know if uh, they will or will not. Uh, actually, one person has has said that they would. And that's Alfonso Dunn. 
I don't know if you know who he is. He's primarily a pen and ink artist, but he does some watercolor too. Uh, he was one of the first artists I ever uh, subscribed to. So I will probably circle back around to him and see if he's still willing to do that. He said he would do an interview and I have some other ideas about some artists. Uh, those are the only thing. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. I, I am pushing my channel a little more i've tried to in the last couple of years actually uh pushing uh a little more into mixed media still with watercolor as the main base but what what around watercolor will work um i'm playing with some ideas using acrylic over watercolor just the same way you might use gouache with watercolor you can actually use oils uh, over watercolor, if you seal it properly. Pastel chalks. Pardon me. Pastel chalks. Uh, uh, pastel pencils. Uh, probably not chalks. Uh, I don't really use those, but I, I have. I've actually done some with uh, pastel pencils, like the Faber Castell pencils. Um. So yeah, uh, try to do trying to do more gouache. Uh, now, off-channel, I have a course that I'm going to be doing for Etcher Labs. It's supposed to uh, premiere in the fall sometime. Um, it's actually, I'm going to use sort of the same course structure that I used. Uh, I, I taught some classes here locally back pre-COVID around in 2019, and I've got, still have all those notes and handouts, so I'll probably make a digital course around that. And that will be rolled out with Etcher. I just finished up a Strathmore workshop. It's a four video workshop, which is free. Strathmore was really great to work with, and that will be up for a year. That'll still be up. Um, people can go to strathmoreartists.com, I think it is. And um, uh, there's four uh, roughly 20 minute videos there and they can uh take that that was on spontaneous painting it's probably the most extensive workshop i've done on spontaneous painting so yeah that's those are the only particulars right now well that's Let's super take cool. it as it comes i'll probably probably try to sneak you back on to the show again and i really appreciate your time sure. steve this has been Super cool. This has been totally different than any of the other. And if you didn't know about Steve, the link is going to be down in the description to go over to his page and socials. Can we say goodbye to Reese? <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. I really enjoyed this. So, yeah, hit me up again and we'll talk. All right. See you later, guys. Take care. We'll see you in the Thanks, next video. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Like, seriously, there were so many nuggets. We went like an hour and 17 minutes with Steve. I'm definitely going to have him back on the show. So keep watching our <laughs> interviews. Thank you for all of your wonderful um questions as you saw steve share you guys we love these questions it tells us so much about our videos it gets me thinking about other material to do so if you have any questions about today's interview go ahead and put them down in the comments what did you like about this what would you like to see more in these interviews we've got this new series with new questions if you're new to these, uh, there's more. There's a whole ton more uh, over there. I believe in the playlist, you can click on the podcast and go watch the rest of this. So thank you so much for encouraging my behavior on being on this platform and hanging out with you with all these amazing professional artists. Go check out Steve's videos. You're going to love him and Reese. And it was so good to hear the wonderful story about our new friend Reese. All right. Take care. I will see you soon in the next video. Oh, and keep those brushes wet. Take care. See you. Bye.